Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, to everyone for coming. And I want to welcome you first now to the Heinz C. Prechter uh, lecture. This is our ninth uh, lecture. And uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Leroy Hoods, who's going to be the keynote speaker starting at 2 o'clock. But uh, first, I want to ask John Graydon to come up and introduce uh, Wally Prechter. John Graydon, as is uh, noted here, is the executive director of the University of Michigan Depression Center. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, I would like to join him and others in welcoming all of you and thanking you for coming today. You're in for a special treat if you haven't heard Dr. Hood talk before. Uh, he's terrific. It's my privilege to just do the introduction of someone also terrific and special. As you can surmise, this lectureship is named in honor of the Prechter family. My relationship with the Prechter family goes back to 1999, 20th century. I mean, it's a, we're a long way back. My first connection with Heinz and Wally actually occurred when I received a contact, and there was a question, uh, an important question. Why are there no centers of excellence for depressions or bipolar illnesses as there are for cancers or cardiovascular diseases or diabetes. And the query launched what I think is a 15-year crusade now to combat brain mood disorders, related conditions, and to try to work on prevention of suicide. It's still underway. Much progress has been made, but we have so much yet to do. Heinz and Wally requested that I meet with them, and with Stephanie, actually, and tell them about mood disorders, what I knew, about what Michigan brought or could bring to the story, and to make a proposal. And I did so. In 2001, the regents of the university approved establishment of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Depression Center. That was the inaugural center of its kind. You already, I think, know this, but sadly, Heinz had died in the interim and was not here to celebrate that launch with us. Mrs. Prechter was indomitable in pursuing the crusade that the two of them had started. She still is. As a sidebar, it's worth noting that the fifth item in the proposal that we had put together, much of it with their help, actually was to recognize that we needed to have an integration of cutting-edge science, large samples, longitudinal monitoring long-term, as you've already heard, and that one center would never be enough. We needed a network. We needed a collaboration. And that was started, and that's actually moved forward. So the National Network of Depression Centers started with 16 places, now has 23, and there are six more in Canada. And in some ways, the Prechter impetus gets the credit for even starting that fire. So the family was pivotal, as you can hear, in helping to change the landscape of attacking bipolar illnesses and depressions, not only locally, but in the world. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Wally has been an icon in that crusade. She's She's president and founder, as you also heard, of the Heinz C. Prechter Fund uh, for Manic Depression. Started in 2001, the title has changed. In 2004, the fund was transferred to the University of Michigan Health System. And that name you'll hear again, it's the Heinz C. Prechter Bipolar uh, Research Fund at the University of Michigan Depression Center. But there's more to Wooly. She also serves as president of the World Heritage Foundation. Prechter Family Fund, it's a philanthropic entity devoted to areas of health and education. She holds leadership positions and numerous civic positions throughout Southeast Michigan and the nation. President Bush requested that she be a member of his commission to attack mental health issues some years ago. Jennifer Granholm, as governor of Michigan, did the same for the state. She's an inaugural member of our National Advisory Board in the Depression Center, the Michigan School of Education Dean's Advisory Council, the Kresge Eye Institute, the German American Committee of the USA, and many others. Lee Hood, as you'll hear, uh, it's reflected, I think, maybe in his talk, if not in his title, 
we'll talk about the P's of science. We all seem to have gotten addicted to P's. Um, precise, preci precision, predictive, etc. In my years of knowing Wally, she has her own P's. She's passionate, persistent, persuasive, personal, and she's a prototype in my eyes. She's a pillar, a pillar of hope, and we need so many more like her. And that's why we're doing events like this today. Wally is perhaps the most passionate about scientific advances, and she gets excited. You saw Stephanie in that video, and I remember when Stephanie, when Wally told me the story about how Stephanie responded to the news about the induced pluripotent stem cell stuff. Uh, we need more of that, too. Lately, um, I have been suggesting that the efforts to achieve progress are showing progress. I mean, we're really moving closer. We still have a way to go. I've said that, but I've used the phrase tipping point, and I smiled with some delight when I saw it reflected in Lee's title. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, we have made tipping point progress in scientific advances, integration, and in essence, in decreasing stigma, media attention. What we really need are the breakthroughs, and they're coming. Much of the credit for doing that goes to Wally Prechter. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a leader, a pioneer, and a friend. Thank you, Dr. Graydon. Um, I'm honored to be here today at the ninth annual Prechter Le Bipolar Lecture and to welcome all of you and most importantly and especially our keynote speaker, Dr. Hood. My family and I created the fund in November of 2001 after the suicide of my husband, Heinz, who had been suffering from bipolar illness for a great part of his life to help decipher the intricacies and genetics of bipolar illness and to find solutions and strategies for people with the illness. In 2004, we moved the fund to the University of Michigan Health System. It is now housed at the Depression Center, which is a natural fit under the great leadership of Dr. McGinnis. The Heinz Brechter Bipolar Research Fund is the largest of its kind in the nation, with the largest uh, long-term research study of bipolar in the nation. All of our data is stored in the Brechter Bipolar Genetics Repository, along with numerous other projects that are being supported by the fund with the ultimate goal of finding personalized treatment of bipolar, as well as prevention of the illness, so people can lead healthy and productive lives. What started as a desperate thought to do something about an illness that can take so many lives has become a great research fund and program, the place to come to as a patient, a place of great hope, where research turns into results for bipolar patients, a place where, research, where resilience truly can happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it is uh, my now distinct pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Eric Barrett, who has joined the university just in the past year as the head of the development office uh, here at the University of Michigan. And so we've asked him to come up and uh, say a few words on behalf of the university uh, regarding the fund and the importance of the fund here at the university. So uh, Mr. Eric Barrett, please. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Dr. McGinnis. Uh, thanks for the introductory and the invitation to speak today at this important Heinz C. Prechter Bipolar Research Fund uh, for the University of Michigan and beyond. The university, as we all know, has a rich history of partnering with smart, passionate, and generous individuals who push us to be even greater than we thought possible. So today I also want to thank Wally for what she is one of the university's most passionate partners. Her vision, her leadership has helped create the premier bipolar research program in the country. Wally and the Heinz C. Prechter Research Fund at the University of Michigan Depression Center serves as a catalyst for raising community awareness and identifying better options for individuals suffering from bipolar disease. The Prechter Fund is part of the fabric of the university. There's been tremendous progress, as others have mentioned today, since the fund was first moved to the University of Michigan, but there's still so much more we can do, and we need your help doing it. Dr. McGinnis and his team have bold vision for how their efforts over the next decade will help those with bipolar live healthy, productive lives. I will leave it to him to provide those exciting details, and we'll hear more from Dr. Hood. 
As many of you are aware, the University of Michigan is part, or the health system is part of the University of Victors for Michigan's fundraising campaign, an ambitious effort to raise $4 billion for the university and over a billion dollars for the health system alone. Our ultimate goal is to accelerate the work of the university experts like Dr. McGinnis and his team to conquer complex challenges like bipolar disease. The Prechter Fund is a top camp campaign priority. Over the next decade, we aim to raise another $15 million to support the work started here by the Prechter Fund. And we hope Dr. McGinnis and his colleagues will be able to extrapolate th those gifts into um, NIH and other grants to, to double or triple the amount that we're able to raise through philanthropy. We look forward to working with Wally and others to realize the team's full vision, provide a beacon of hope for everyone suffering from bipolar disease. Again, thanks so much for allowing me to be with you today for this important event, and congratulations to the entire team for hosting this ninth annual Prechter Lecture. Can't thank Wally and her family enough for making this possible and changing people's lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, you now, as part of the, the, the Prechter Lecture, as I mentioned, we began around nine years ago with the inaugural lecture. And over the years, we have evolved and done it in a variety of ways. But we've always had a theme of updating some elements uh, in the progress of the Prechter studies itself, and then having a keynote speaker to uh, comment on their work and tell us about new things that, that they're doing. So this year, I will be talking about uh, an update uh, on our work and so the title of my talk is Longitudinal Studies, Past, Present, and Future. And so I am the director and the principal investigator of the Heinze Prechter Bipolar Research Fund. And when I came to Michigan approximately 11 years ago, and just as the fund was um, being transferred here to Michigan, I had the distinct pleasure and an honor of meeting Wally Prechter and her family. Now, many of you will know that I've been involved in genetics research with bipolar disorder for a good number of years. And in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we were enthusiastic, but we were concerned that we were finding the modest effects and the genes were not really hitting a home run. And so we thought that we needed another strategy. And so we needed to get individuals into a long-term study and follow them over the course of time. Bipolar disorder is an illness that the trajectory, the course of the illness, is as much an expression of the illness itself as a one-time assessment. We learned from, from heart disease. And so there's a big study called the Framingham study that followed individuals over the course of time. And what we've learned from that study, from the Framingham study, is what your doctor tells you about heart disease and what has influenced our behaviors in terms of smoking and cholesterol over the years. So we're seeking to do the same for bipolar disorder. So what I want to do today is to talk to you a little bit about the rationale and the background for the Prechter repository, the status and the updates, and the impact of the repository. And we're making an impact now. The vision of the Prechter uh, Bipolar Repository is to personalize the treatment for bipolar disorder. What works for one patient may not work for the next. We want to be able to prevent recurrences. We want people to be able to live with bipolar disorder, be productive, and lead healthy lives. Every once in a while, I wonder to myself, or people ask me, why do you study bipolar disorder? What interests you about bipolar disorder? I thought about it, and by, the study of bipolar disorder really truly is the study of humanity. The range of human experience, the depth of the depression, the top of the highs, just the range of expression of emotion and behavior is the range of human behavior as we know it today. Man has never been closer to the deity than in a manic state. And so think about Schubert, 20,000 bars of music in one year, eight songs in one day in October 1815. That's 200 years ago. Just 200 years ago, this guy did this. Nine church works, symphony, and 150 songs in the course of a year. 
So how do we define bipolar disorder? I've thought about it in terms of how to really give the info get the information out. And so I like to think of bipolar disorder as pathology in our energy states. And so you see there on the left a person in a rather elevated energy state, so just doing things that seem to be unbelievable, incomprehensible, and we think to ourselves, how can a person do that? How can they accomplish that? And on the right, uh, you see an individual in the depths of their depression, and so the energy level in those two states are remarkably different. And so just in, a, in one word, to think about how you describe bipolar disorder, think energy. The unfortunate thing about bipolar disorder is that the range, range of emotions, they define the extremes of human emotions. The depressions, the darkness of the depressions are overwhelming. I had one person tell me that they were convinced that they were truly in, in the possession of, of the devil or the, you know, the, um, um, the darkest moment in their lives. Suicide rates are high in, in uh, bipolar disorder. In our study, in the, in the Prechter Bipolar Study, 4% of people attempt suicide a year. So these are our, the participants that are in our study. These are people that are receiving care, they're getting care, uh, and they're in the clinics. These are people that are not being attended to, but they're in our, uh, in our study. And uh, even though we are attentive to them, we learned uh, in retrospect that uh, a number of them have attempted suicide. Sadly, we've had a number of suicides. In our, uh, in our study uh, as well. It's a very dark day when that happens. The mood instability is rather profound, and so that uh, in one of our studies we've noted that around only 30% of the times that a person calls in that they're in a normal mood, so that means that around 70% of the time an individual with bipolar disorder is in a mood state that is not if you will, in the zone. So they're, uh, they're either experiencing syndromal symptoms of depression or syndromal symptoms of mania or subsyndromal symptoms of either one. So that's a, a rather um, problematic uh, to, uh, state. So when we started the Heinz Prechter Bipolar uh, Genetics Repository, we wanted to collect as much information as we possibly could. So the repository is a collection of clinical data, it's a collection of uh, biological data, and so you see in the circle there, this is representing a number of the projects that, that we have. But we're pulling together a whole symphony, if you will, of data together in one spot. So we have longitudinal clinical data. We have information as to how the person is doing over the course of time. We have neuropsychological data wherein the person has to do these intolerable tests of, uh, you know, how you can put round pegs and square holes, if you will, or filling out little forms to test your ability to think and, 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 and reason. Uh, we've just started a study involved in the microbiome. We are what we eat. We're looking at what goes through our body to determine if there are uh, things that we can understand from that. We're looking at stem cells, as you saw in the study or in the, uh, on the video here, to look at ways that we can model the disorder in a laboratory dish. And so many of you will know about individuals uh, that have donated their brains to science, and they've had a variety of different illnesses, and so they're looking at expression levels or at patterns in, in brains from people that have deceased with a disorder, but that's the end stage illness. The ability to look at stem cells allows us to study the disorder from the beginning and look at how cells evolve. One of the things that I've heard from patients and from family members is that, you know, my son, my daughter was different from the, from the day they were born, absolutely different from the day. I knew there was something wrong with that kid. I knew there was something different about him. So the ability to use stem cells to study the progression of how nerves develop and how they behave over different uh, developmental time periods is absolutely critical and will help us to understand how disease evolves. Second, uh, the final point there is the Priori Smartphone app. And so we're looking at uh, using how we, can, how we can use mobile health to study the pattern of the illness. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So this, this slide really uh, describes the process. We have individuals come in for an initial, initial visit. Excuse me, they do a diagnostic interview. We have these neuropsychological testing. We have lots of questionnaires and we follow them up. The commitment 
of the individuals that are participants. We call them our participant collaborators. They're dedicated to the project. They love the project. They tell me all the time, you know, Dr. Megan, I'm just doing so much better because I'm participating in this project. And so we were talking about this earlier on, about when, paper, when, when individuals are engaged in research, they're looking at how they're doing, they're monitoring their outcome. It's a very engaging process. They feel an ownership to the project. They follow us on the website. They uh, are excited about our progress. It is simply just a delight. And so while we only have 75% that remain engaged over 10 years, that's considered to be pretty good. And the fact of the matter is that many of them come back two or three years later. So, you know, I was a part of the study a couple of years ago. Can I still join in? And we say, of course. So this slide captures my vision for the future. And so you have in the center, you have the individual and the family, the core element of humanity. We're biological beings. We're based on our genetics. We're based on our cells. We're based in biologies. And around us are pillars, our pillars of our social environment. They're pillars of uh, our clinical features, our clinical of how we interact. And we use mobile health. We're interacting with our mobile devices in ways that I certainly wouldn't have um, the dream you know, 10 years ago. And we, our nutrition and our behaviors and our habits, what, uh, what we eat, what we drink, are, uh, are important. And so it all funnels to up to monitoring outcomes so we can determine the best interventions for the uh, individual. And it's the integration of these data points that is the critical thing. We're, uh, to date, in the 20th century, we've been just looking at associating one genetic variable, one biological variable with a clinical outcome, but it's how we use the whole uh, whole, uh, whole of our data. So this is a, a complex slide, but it's really not. It's just a pie wheel to demonstrate to you the elements of our research. So we are integrating all of these features, all of these disciplines, data from all of these disciplines that are being integrated in the center there to look at the integrated effect of what happens to an individual with bipolar disorder. Now, uh, when we talked about there's so much more to do, we don't have complete data sets for each and every one of those things. So for the electrophysiology that you see up there, uh, we've got around 90 to 100 individuals that have done that, but that costs us a whole day to do that, to take the individuals in. We only have around 50 individuals that are using the smartphone device. We have around 50 individuals that are engaged in the stem cell project. And so we've demonstrated that this can be done. We've demonstrated the importance of this, and so we're now uh, continuing to move forward. We do have data on the phenomenology, what we see. We have, do, do have data on the environmental, on the psychology, and the genetics, uh, uh, and uh, the neuropsychology on everyone. So the chart represents many things, what we've done and what we have yet to do. And so the current number is 1,152 that are in the longitudinal study. Now, I want to show this slide for, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, so it is really important to appreciate the years of an individual with bipolar disorder. And what you're looking at here, the big ticks along the bottom are represent the years. If you can see them, the small uh, ticks represent two months. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, on the left, the PHQ-9, that's a symptomatic severity score of a depression rating scale. And what you're seeing there is, is that there is a variability in the period and the amplitude of the variation in the PHQ-9, which means that there are individuals who have mood disorders are going up and down all the time. Their mood's fluctuating all over the place. There are individuals that do not seem to fluctuate uh, very much at all. But mostly what you look at on that slide is chaos, right? I mean, it looks like, you know, you think to yourself, how in the wild world of sport can you make something out of that? So uh, we have very smart people that we're working with, and among them are people that are uh, mathematicians. And mathematicians, you say, why are you, doing, why are you working with mathematicians? Well, the mathematicians, they love numbers. That's what mathematicians do. And they think, oh, the more complex the data, the more I love it, you know? And so, uh, so we only have 40 individuals here, so they've taken uh, data from several hundred individuals. And so on the upper right there, you see those little uh, clusters of dots. And so the they, what the mathematicians have done is that they've taken the course of illness uh, of these individuals and run and developed some al algorithms to be able to partition out classes, subclasses of individuals with bipolar one disorder. And so this represent what represents what we can do. It represents the importance of the longitudinal database. So I talked about impact. So just this week, I was 
th thinking through how to represent their imp our impact. And so I have numerous examples of people that call, or patients and uh, participants that call up and, and, and say how wonderful it is to be a participant in this and it is valuable for them to be uh, engaged. But we've also teamed up with a large number of early career investigators, mid-level career investigators, and senior investigators that delight in using the data to analyze it and to publish papers on it. And so that is ultimately the impact uh, at uh, you know, a national and international level is getting the information out there. And so just give you a, you know, a snapshot of some of the papers that we have um, uh, published. Dr. O'Shea tells the story, and we, we uh, ran into each other, talked uh, in 2010 about the idea of developing uh, induced pluripotent stem cells for this. And so this came from an idea when I was at a conference that, earlier that year, and um, it was being presented as an option. I said, you know, this is what we need to do in, in bipolar disorder. And it turns out that bipolar disorder is an ideal disorder. It's a, we think it's got a neurodevelopmental uh, element to it. As I mentioned, people say that uh, uh, their child their family member is different from the day one. So I induced pluripotent stem cells are ideal way, as an ideal way to study a disorder like bipolar disorder. It onsets at a particular time in life and has a particular course over time. So we can take cells from the skin, just take a little skin cell. Someone from Sue's lab runs over to the clinic, a little, uh, little glass. Thank you very much. Uh, collects it from the people that have taken it, runs it back to the lab, and starts a process that takes several months uh, to change those cells, to grow them step by step, back in time, if you will, to early staged cells that can subsequently be coaxed into growing into cells that are the organ of your choice. Depends on what the recipe is. So we coax them into growing into nerve cells brain cells. We then do uh, a series of experiments, or I say we in the royal we, the, uh, the, uh, Dr. O'Shea's lab, they do a series of experiments that, for all of you, that have just been astounding and just amazing over the past uh, several years. And what we're doing, what we're doing is modeling how the brain functions in the lab so you can see what the cells are doing so on the video, we talked about, we can look at how the cells communicate with each other, you can look at how the cells respond to different medications, to different conditions. And we're essentially recapitulating the physiological development of a nerve cell in an individual with bipolar disorder. The implications of that are profound. Now, uh, we, of course, we live in the world. And we watch what's going on. We are a part of collaborative efforts. This is uh, the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, which uh, you know I am one of the uh, 800 investigators in the 38 countries that have uh, uh, loosely, with an emphasis on loosely, banded together and identified that there are multiple disorders, uh, any psychiatric disorder. And this, and this, this, these numbers are not from my head. They're from the website of the uh, Psychiatric Genetics Consortium. 900,000 individuals, plus or minus, I'm sure. Uh, but for bipolar disorder, they have around 7,481 7, uh, individuals, and they only have diagnostic data. And how do I know that? Because I contributed uh, that diagnostic data over the years. But the important thing that I want to impress upon you is that there are some findings out there. And there's some findings, what I call kind of hand-waving, and there are genetic loci, genetic genes that are giving a hint, with the emphasis on the hint, that these genes could be implicated in bipolar disorder. So I put the odds ratio up there, and I spoke to a, uh, a um, I was telling this to a financial guy, and he's, he shook his head and said, you know, I'm not sure, entirely sure I would bet on a stock that had an odds ratio of 1.15. But nevertheless, uh, we, it was the best one that we could uh, focus on. So they, uh, this is a, just an image of what happens in the lab, and so we have uh, someone who has a disease gives a skin sample, and those cells are reprogrammed. And this is the work of one of the postdocs in the laboratory, Monica Baim and others, uh, who have been doing episomal reprogramming uh, methods, uh, going through the colonial phases, the uh, embryo bodies, the rosettes, neuronal precursor cells, 
and through to neurons. And so this process can take several weeks uh, to three, four months or longer. So I'm not going to go through much data on this, and I'm just going to show you this one slide that is something that I find to be absolutely amazing. And that is, there's a, uh, uh, what you're looking at here is, uh, you know, the, uh, the red cells, are the red colors, the red bars are bipolar, and the, con and the controls are uh, the um, normal healthy controls. And so the height of those red bars represents the reactivity, how reactive the cells are, how much, how much they fire, if you will, how intensely they fire. And what you can see is that uh, the cells there in the bottom, it says lithium minus and lithium plus. The cells that are grown without lithium, they fire really intensely compared to the controls, significantly more intensely. But when you culture these cells with lithium, they calm down. They calm down to the point where they're very similar in their behavior to the normal cells. Why is this important? It's important, extremely important, because it represents the development of a model, a model that we can use to study other drugs for bipolar disorder. So it's really fundamental to have something in the lab that we can test to be able to go back to someone in the clinic and test that substance so you can go back and forth between the lab and the clinic. And so this is the quintessential translational research and where there's this integrated process of working between the lab and the clinic. The really exciting thing is going to come from developing organoids, clumps of nerve cells that organize themselves in a way that starts to look like a brain. And so this is the work of Ashleen Williams, who's here today, and is uh, looking at how these cells connect, how they start modeling their behavior, offering us a way to test new treatments. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here uh, and uh, speed it up a bit. So I'm going to just talk briefly about speech for modeling mood disorders. Uh, what we've learned over the years is that families will come to us and say, you know, I could hear it in their voice. There was something in the way that uh, my family member was talking, the way that they were talking, and I just knew there was something going on. So we then asked the question, well, if a human brain can tell that there's something different in someone's voice, we should be able to train a computer to be able to analyze the acoustics. And so this is a very complex slide uh, that I think I have a little thing here. And so if you just problem is I'm colorblind and I, this red dot just goes somewhere. I don't know where it goes, but it, uh, it just disappears as soon as I put it on the screen. Um, so, um, so right where that app record calls, so we've devised a system where we have an application on a phone, records all the outgoing calls on a device. It then sends them to a server where the computer scientists analyze this. We pair it with, uh, with an assessment and we try our best to see if we can determine the mood state based on the acoustics. So our area under the curve for that is about 0.7, uh, which means that you know, up to two-thirds of these individuals, we can predict their mood state based on, on their acoustics. And so we've gotten some resources and funding to expand that, to go into the cloud. And so we're now uh, about to embark on a cloud-based project to enhance the number of individuals that we have uh, and, and enlarge our sample size uh, tremendously to look at how we can predict and monitor individuals with bipolar disorder using uh, Priori. It means predicting individual outcomes for rapid interventions, and this is collaboration with Emily Provost at the School of Engineering. So this is really the truly the money slide that, uh, that I show with this. And so this uh, curve here shows when somebody is ramping up, and those of you who know someone with bipolar disorder will know that things start escalating and you wonder, is the person just having a good mood or a good day, or are they going higher and higher and higher and higher? When does the derivative of that change of the acoustic features, when does that hit a particular point where you say, there's something going on here, we got to do something. And so this is the quintessential check engine light. And so we want to be able to develop some kind of an early warning indicator that suggests to the individual that they need to see their doctor. And, uh, and just the, we're uh, you know, in an automotive state here, and so the concept of a check engine light is relatively uh, familiar to uh, all of us. And so if we can identify if something's going 
haywire, and we can mitigate that with an intervention through the medical clinic that we can turn that process along the green line there rather than going the whole nine yards going into the mania. And so this is the next, next project that we are uh, working on. And this is going to be done in the cloud. Uh, we're working on all the security and, and, and uh, ethical issues uh, of this, and we have a lot of metadata that we're going to be looking at. We're looking at the GPS data, the gyrometer, accelerometer, and other data. We want to be able to combine that with electronic medical records, with wearable, potentially with wearable technologies. Uh, and then the question came about, well, we could look at other things. We could look at school performance. So what happens to a student who comes to the University of Michigan with bipolar disorder? Would they agree? to have their school performance associated with uh, an electronic monitoring system with the goal, with the goal of monitoring their health and just to seeing how they're doing because things start to go south on a student or anyone and, they're, and by the time they come and seek help, they're often in the tank uh, by the time they come and see us. And so we need to find ways to help individuals uh, before the problem uh, happens. So security and, and, uh, and uh, the personal health information are major uh, issues that we're dealing with. Uh, we want to be collaborative. We want to work with individuals nationally and internationally to uh, deal with this or to, uh, to address this. There are several sensitive issues that, are, that we're presented with, one of which would be, well, what happens if there's a breach of information? What happens if your privacy is compromised? One of my bipolar patients said to me, listen, you know, I've got to tell you something, Dr. McGinnis. When I get manic and I'm doing something, I buy a Greek island or I do something, you know, uh, and, um, you know out of character, it's blatantly apparent, you know, that there's something wrong. So I don't really, that's the privacy issues, that it really doesn't matter to me all that much. Uh, uh, because if I get, if it prevents me from getting manic, I'm, I'm with you. So uh, just to talk briefly about, we're interested in the mic microbiome. This is a very hot topic, and so Dr. Simon Evans is working uh, on that and uh, really got through a number of uh, projects. So here are interactions with uh, the core facilities to study the microbiome, and so next year we're going to be telling you more about, uh, about that. Now, I'm just going to uh, ask you to relax your imagination for a moment and, uh, and, and, uh, and just bear with me. I'm one of the few people that I know uh, that had never been to Disney World. And uh, so I was, just, I was uh, just enamored with it, and the brilliance of Disney was profound. And the question came to my mind, so how are we going to integrate you know, the technology? How are we going to integrate technology and the biology and thinking it through? And so then I went to Disney and I said, listen, if you can dream it, and there's the castle. So the next slide that I'm going to show you is my final slide, or a second to final slide. It's the electronic equivalent, the slide equivalent of a napkin in a cocktail bar. Okay, so scientists, when they say, well, listen, I got a really good idea here, and they'll sort of they'll whip out their pen, they haven't got anything to write on, so they grab a napkin, right? You've seen that? And uh, they'll draw it out. So this is the way it's going to be. And so, so this is uh, my equivalent of a slide with a, uh, uh, with, a, with a napkin. Now, bear with me here, because I'm going to convince you that all of the constituent parts are here. We just need to focus on how we're going to do it, and we're going to do it. So we have a mobile device. We have a phone that can gather acoustic features of speech. We know that speech and how we talk associate with our mood. We got that data. So we can, look, we can analyze that. We need to improve on that. We need to do a little better analysis, and we need to, you know, it needs to be a little bit snappier. So we know the phone. It's got a transmitter in it. That's what phones do, mobile phones. So it can transmit to a receiver. So you have a receiver that could be implanted in the body. And that receiver receives the message and say, you know, you know, McInnes is talking too fast, or he's doing something goofy here, or he's not, you know, something's amiss. So that receiver could be programmed to trigger a really small microscopic beam of light. And we know that beams of light can stimulate cells to function in a particular manner. So we know that this is op called optogenetics. So those cells could then release a substance that is needed to calm the individual down into the bloodstream. And so when you think about it, this is the ultimate way 
of managing mood. And so the challenge that I have, uh, you know, when you think about pharma, the, the, you know, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacology, we're giving medications at a constant dose over the course of time to manage an illness that's going up and down all the time. And so when the next generation of doctors starts, you know, looking at what we're doing critically and say, what were they thinking you know, about? How were they thinking through what you're doing, you know, what you did with an illness that is cyclical? It would be rather silly to think we could manage diabetes with a constant dose of insulin. We have to give insulin in a manner that responds to the, uh, to the blood sugar. So this is my, if you, you know, if you can, if you can dream it, you can do it, uh, kind of a, kind of a, uh, kind of a story. And I want you to appreciate that we're not able to do this yet. This is not something that we're going to go, that you're going to, you know, read about and find out about. But I think it's going to happen. And I think it's going to happen. So thank you for hearing my, uh, uh, my, uh, the updates uh, on the um, Prechter, uh, the progress of the Prechter uh, program. And it is now my sincere delight and privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. Leroy Hood. Uh, I heard Dr. Hood speak uh, in the 1990s at Hopkins, and I realized at that moment uh, uh, that I was in the presence of someone who had tremendous insights and energies uh, you know, in the genomics field, because I was struggling in the lab working with a particular methodology, and I came and I saw this guy talking, he said, son of a gun, hi, you know, this is going to be <laughs> amazing when we get there, and we were there sooner than I, than I thought. Uh, two year, uh, a number of years ago, I saw Lee speak here uh, in 2008, here in this very hall. Uh, his talks are incredibly ex inspiring. His energy and inspiration have been recognized nationally, internationally, uh, for the past 25 years. And a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, 2011, he's received the Presidential Award for the Biosciences. And, uh, and was awarded that to get provided with the medal uh, a couple of years ago. So it is with tremendous honor and pleasure that I introduce Leroy Hood to give the ninth uh, Heinz C. Prechter Lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and congratulate Melvin on this wonderful organization that he has uh, created and, and, the, and the Prechner lectureship and support, I think, is a wonderful contribution to an incredibly important area. What I'd like to talk about really are tipping points. So I would say a tipping point and how we practice medicine, I would say a tipping point in healthcare, and I would say a tipping point in pointing toward how we can take on really complex diseases like uh, bipolar disease. And I'll give you a taste of uh, all of these things. When I went to um, Caltech in 1970 as a young assistant professor, I was really uh, challenged by the enormous complexity of both biology and, uh, and medicine and disease. And I was really impressed with the fact that the tools of that day, the early emergence of molecular biology, didn't begin to meet the complexities that uh, awaited us in both those areas. And in fact, the analogy was very much like the elephant and the six blind men, each feeling a different part of the elephant and pronouncing that it was a spear or a pole or a fan, when in fact the elephant was all of these things and much more. The elephant, of course, being a complex system. And the challenges at that time were several fold. One is we had no way to talk easily about biological complexity. And that later came as uh, systems thinking, a systems approach to, uh, to biology and medicine. And of course, the second was that we didn't have the proper tools or strategies 
for trying to understand all the complexities of the elephant, that is, of this complex system. And at that time, I really got enamored with the technology strategy side of things and got uh, involved over uh, the next 45 years of my career in thinking of, about a series of paradigm changes that let us deal with biological complexity, but at the same time, they really pointed us toward a very new kind of medicine that I've called systems medicine and P4 medicine, and we'll talk about that. So the first was the fact that uh, Caltech, we started, we brought engineering to biology. We started developing a whole series of six different instruments over the years that allowed one operationally to read and write uh, DNA and proteins. And, and what these did for us in terms of complexity was they opened up the initial approach to high throughput biological measurements. And, and they really ushered in the era of big data and its analytics. And we'll see how important that is. One of the instruments we developed, the automated DNA sequencer, got me invited to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project in the spring of 1985 at Santa Cruz, where 12 people came and debated the merits and whether, in fact, it was even possible to have a human genome project. And we came to two conclusions. One was that it was, although it was going to be very complex at that time. The second was the fact that we were split six to six on whether this was a good idea. And those against it were really fanatically against it. And of course, going out into the community in 85 and 86 and 87, I came to realize that about 80 or 90 percent of the biologists really opposed the Human Genome Project, primarily on doctrinaire grounds. It was big science, and big science would take money from small science, not realizing uh, the enormous synergy of the two. Uh, and the institute that opposed the Genome Project most vigorously was NIH. And they fought it bitterly up until the very end in 89 when a National Academy committee uh, said there is going to be a genome project. And NIH, of course, jumped on the other side and was uh, a leader in, in pushing the, uh, the achievement of the uh, genome project. For me, again, what the genome did was it gave us a complete parts list of uh, all the genes in a human and other organisms whose genomes were developed. And for the first time, we could really start, start thinking about uh, a systems approach to biology. I'll say also that creating the automated DNA sequencer required bringing together first class chemistry with engineering, with computer science, and, and molecular biology. And I realized that biology in the future, especially leading edge biology in the future, had to have a cross-disciplinary foundation, bringing together all of the flavors of scientists so leading-edge biology could drive the development of related and relevant technologies. And they, in turn, could catalyze the development of the appropriate uh, types of analytic tools. I tried to persuade Caltech at the time that this would be a good thing to do. And everyone at Caltech, including the president, and Engineering and chemistry and physics thought the idea was great. The biologists vetoed it uh, for reasons that I think are uh, obvious. So Bill Gates made it possible to go to the University of Washington and set up the first such department in 1992. And it was spectacularly successful. We invented, our faculty invented, the first two technologies of the then newly emerging field of proteomics. Uh, it developed the software that drove the whole human genome project. We pioneered the inkjet synthesizer technology that allowed very rapid DNA synthesis, DNA array synthesis, and so forth, and so on. But it was clear in the context of the bureaucracy at a state university, it was very hard to take the next step, which I thought about, and that was systems biology. So in 2000, I resigned and started the first institute for systems biology, whose focus really was a systems application 
to biology and disease. And that, of course, led quite naturally to systems medicine and the emergence of P4 medicine. And that's really what we'll talk about for the rest of this lecture. Except I, I would make two points from these five paradigm changes. So the first thing I learned is almost never can new ideas really merge successfully from old institutions with bureaucracies that have been honed by their past history. On each of these first four cases, we had to create a completely new organizational entity to drive the emergence of these paradigm changes. And we'll see what happens for the fifth uh, paradigm change. And I'd say that the uh, sixth thing, these are the instruments that we developed over the years, is the enor enormous importance of transferring knowledge that you acquire to society. I remember when I went to the president of Caltech in about 78 and said, we were developing these instruments and I wanted to start a company. What did he think about that? And he gave me a long speech about the role of academic institutions is scholarship and education. It isn't commercialization. And I said, well, my point of view is it should be to transfer knowledge to society. And he said, you're on your own. You can do it, but Caltech won't help you in any way. So uh, it was actually a very good thing. I learned how to create companies and, uh, and uh, was, was good at it. But the important point is, for each achievement, you have to create an entity that can realize it. And in each of these cases, we, first four instruments, we created applied biosystems. The, for the inkjet printer, we actually developed it initially so through a co another company we started, Rosetta, that then uh, presented it to Agilent, and they finished the commercialization. And then for the uh, nanostring encounter, which I'm going to talk about later, because it's a very interesting uh, new instrument, uh, we created a company uh, in Seattle, uh, nanostring itself. So what really are the central features of this thing we call systems medicine? I'd say there are three important features. One is, again, hearkening back to the analogy of the elephant, for any complex kind of system, you need an enormous amount of data. And the medicine of the future is going to have billions upon billions of data points for each individual that can be integrated and modeled to reveal actionable possibilities that can either improve wellness, and or let us avoid disease. One of the things we can do with this enormous amount of data is we can create the, we can uh, determine the relevant biological networks. And of course, these are the information conduits that regulate development, physiology, aging. And when they become disease perturbed, they catalyze disease. So, with these networks, if we can distinguish the difference between a normal network and its disease-perturbed uh, counterpart, we can begin to gain fundamental insights into disease mechanisms and new approaches to uh, therapy and, and uh, diagnostic tools and so forth. And of course, the idea is that these networks operate at all levels of the organization. They operate in the sense at the level of chromosomes, at the level of molecules, at the level of cells, at the level of organs, and of course, at the level of uh, organisms themselves. The third point, of, of course, is how we look at data. It should be global or comprehensive, dynamical data looking either at how it changes in time or how it changes in space is utterly critical. I'll give you some examples of this. And we have to be able to carry out these integrations of data that I talked about. And again, I'll show you some simple examples of this. But what is really important to realize is if you create these uh, virtual, dense, and dynamic data clouds for each individual, an enormous amount of that data are noise. And it's noise of two types. One, it's technical in nature, and we can deal with that 
via statistics and so forth. But the overwhelming amount of noise is biological noise coming from irrelevant biologies to whatever disease process you're interested in. And the key question is, how do you get rid of the biological noise? And I'll say unequivocally, for those of you who think big data only needs machine learning, you couldn't be more wrong. It leads machine learning blended together with domain expertise. And frankly, that's why Microsoft and Google and all of their initial efforts at health uh, uh, objectives have really failed. They haven't realized the importance of uh, domain expertise. So by 2006 or so, we really had articulated what systems biology was and what this uh, P4 biology was. We'll talk about that later. And one of the questions I began thinking about is how could we bring this to the healthcare system? And of course, the real, uh, what I thought about seriously again was the elephant analogy because what we needed at that point was to develop a whole series of technologies and strategies that we could use to deconvolute the complexity of disease. And the unfortunate aspect was many of those were too harebrained and wild and high risk to ever get funded by NIH or any federal funding agencies. So it was in that context that I had, I in 2007 met the uh, Minister of Finance for Luxembourg, who at that time was thinking about the possibility of revamping his country economy, changing it from a 90% dependence on financial services to bring in healthcare and biotech. And he asked ISB to write a proposal to help him do that. So we did that. And we did for them a whole series of things that were enormously successful that I won't talk about. But what they did for us was to give us $100 million to invent the tools and technologies of P4 medicine. And that was over a five-year period. That let us take on these risky, uh, high-gain uh, ventures. And actually, most of them ended up working out again. We could never have gotten them funded at NIH. Or if we did, we could never have gotten them much beyond a proof of principle to push them into where they actually were really useful. So we, we developed about uh, 10 technologies or so. And it was then in 2013 that I first suggested one way to think about introducing P4 and systems medicine to the healthcare system would be to create a project wherein we looked at 100,000 well individuals creating for each dense and dynamic data clouds that will let us assess what the elements of wellness were and what the elements of disease transitions were. And in fact, in 2014, we put together a volunteer group of 107, and for a year, we carried out that project. And as you'll hear, it's worked spectacularly successful. And of course, the irony was in, uh, in his 2015 State of the Union address, Obama announced precision medicine. And I would argue what I'm talking about here is a wonderful example of precision medicine. And keep this in mind. I think it's a wonderful example of how you can attack any complex disease, including bipolar disease. And we'll talk more about that later. So we've developed a whole series of different technologies, uh, most of which I'm not really going to talk about. I will say that the third generation sequencing technology is now just beginning to emerge with single molecule analysis, nanopore uh, uh, channels, and electronic detection, I think will push the human genome uh, cost uh, down to $100 in a period of five to eight years. And that uh, will change the dimensions of how we can think about genome sequencing. Uh, Peptide protein capture agents, we're going to talk a little bit about later because they're going to take the place of monoclonal antibodies. Single cell analysis is unbelievably important, as are the new kinds of 
mass spectrometry, but we won't uh, really talk about those. The strategies that we developed, systems-driven strategies, are listed here. Family genome sequencing for disease genes, following disease progression from beginning to end. We never do that in human beings, uh, or we haven't done it in the past. Making blood a window into distinguishing health from disease, and finally these uh, longitudinal, individual, high-dimensional data studies that we've talked about. Each of those four things we'll uh, briefly cover. And it's in the context of uh, family genome sequencing and the identification of disease genes that uh, I had my first interesting brush with uh, bipolar disease. And the idea here is when you sequence all the members of a family, it gives you the wherewithal to get rid of most of the sequencing errors by uh, simple Mendelian analyses. It allows you to identify rare variants because if they're in two or more members of the family, they're a variant and not a sequencing error. It allows you to determine haplotypes, that is, the, the constellations of collections of allelic variants for the maternal and paternal chromosomes. And these are really important in reducing the dimensionality of the search for uh, disease genes and so forth. Uh, and um, we, we've kind of pioneered family genomics, both from the point of view of disease analyses, and we've looked at many, many different diseases. We've done some really interesting studies on wellness. I won't really talk about those. We've developed an enormous amount of software, so we have a platform for looking at these things. I'll show you that in just a moment. And we've carried out more classic uh, uh, genome analyses. Um, Here's an example of the software that the Family Genomics Group have developed. And actually, this slide is about uh, a year old. And we've got probably uh, six more packages that should be included here. But they allowed us to use, again, principles of Mendelian genetics to do a kind of analysis you had never been able to do uh, for simple Mendelian traits and even for, as we'll see in just a moment, the more complex traits like uh, bipolar disease. So this was a study that was carried out uh, sequencing 200 individuals in 41 families that had multiple affected bipolars. And we compared that with the genomes of 158 uh, control families that were matched in various ways. And what we were able to demonstrate using family genomics often just a single family giving us the disease gene or multiple disease genes were the fact that many of these variants that cause diseases were indeed rare variants and that every family member on average had six or more of these variants as contrasted with one or less uh, in the control family. What was particularly exciting is all of these variants really affected the control of neuronal excitability. There was a relevant functionality. And in fact, the major sets of them fell into the GABA receptor genes and the uh, calcium ion channels. So these are all things enormously relevant and fascinating to bipolar disease. We actually at one time had about 140 or so genes that were interesting variants. We took 26 of these and we looked at 3,000 sporadic individuals and demonstrated that six of those we did indeed find again as candidate disease genes uh, in that particular disorder. What was also interesting is in this one gene where we found 13 different variants, 12 of the 13 fell outside the coding regions. And in the set as a whole, more than 90% of the variants fell outside coding regions. So if you're thinking about doing exon sequencing with complex genetic traits, I'd take this uh, into account. It, it would be a very serious consideration against it. 
In three cases, we went on to prove that what were hypothetical regulatory mutations did indeed modify the expression of their uh, cognate gene. So this means that a lot of the genetics of bipolar disease will be these very rare variants, and they'll be working in concert with, with one another in clusters and groups. And it really changes, I think, how we think about the genetics of uh, bipolar disease in very, very interesting ways. What about the dynamics of the entire disease process? What we did in looking at prion-induced neurodegeneration is we knew when time zero was, and we could follow the disease process and its progression all the way through to the end. And when we did that, we had really some striking results. We were able to identify about 300 disease-perturbed genes in the brain transcriptome, and these mapped into four major uh, uh, networks, uh, protein interaction networks, prion accumulation and, and uh, replication, uh, glial activation, and two forms of neurodegeneration. What was really striking is those four major networks became disease perturbed in a sequential, uh, always the same order in all mice, starting with the most specific network, uh, prion replication and accumulation. And the importance of that is when you're thinking about diseases, you want to know the earliest stage of transition and work with that to ask the question, can we get the diagnostics and the therapeutics to reverse that immediately before you ever get downstream uh, to the more damaging processes? So uh, we were able to see in the brain changes that occurred at seven weeks and the first clinical signs of the disease didn't show up at 18 months. So the next question I asked is, what about the blood? Can we look for markers in the blood that will give us these very earliest warning signs? And it turned out we could because we had identified, in a way I won't describe, 200 brain-specific transcripts that secreted proteins into the blood in a way that could be detected by a particular kind of mass spectrometry, uh, targeted mass spectrometry. And these 200 proteins mapped into major functional aspects of brain activity. And when the brain became disease perturbed, those regions that were perturbed, disease perturbed, had disease perturbed networks would alter the corresponding cognate function. So it was a wonderful diagnostic tool. We did the same for mouse, and we looked at 15 proteins that mapped into those four major networks. And indeed, we were able to detect the earliest network in the blood at only a week or so later than the seven weeks we detected by looking at transcripts in the brain itself. And we were able, indeed, to show the, the successive disease perturbation of each of the four networks. So you can identify early change in disease and the progression uh, throughout of disease. What we were also able to demonstrate is that there were six other networks that were involved in addition to these four major ones. And that collectively, when you looked at the dynamics of these 10 networks, they explained for virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. So this was really a very powerful approach. Now, how could we do this kind of disease process in humans? The best way are these longitudinal studies I'll talk about toward the end of the lecture. But I will tell you, we studied with uh, collaborators uh, at, at uh, a, a hospital uh, in, uh, uh, in China, uh, 10 patients that had either three or four successive gliomas removed. And from each of those different tumors, we determined the complete sequence 
and we sequenced the germline DNA from each of those patients. And what this did was gave us a sense of the progression of cancer in this particular case. And it let us do mutational evolutionary profiles. It let us compare how different drugs worked. It let us distinguish passenger mutations from the driver mutations. And that's a big area in cancer genomics these days. Most of the mutations you see are passengers. They aren't relevant to the disease at all. How do you figure out what the real drivers are? And, and dynamics can let you figure that out. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is it also revealed fundamental mechanisms of tumor diversification. And I'll show you just one data slide on this. So these are two patients, uh, patient three and patient four. And what you see in patient three is the mutational process is generating enormous number of SNPs. And in patient four, the mutational process is chromosomal rearrangements uh, and deletions. So as you go from one tumor uh, in patient three to the next, and one in four to the next, if you look on the outside, you can see uh, an increasing number of SNP mutations. Whereas if you look on the inside and the lines that joins things in the center of these concentric circles, you can see increased deletions and rearrangements and so forth. So there's a mutator mechanism and there's a structural variant mechanism. And the other eight individuals fell in between these two. So they give us an approach to looking at the mutational mechanisms that drive the cancer process. And that's because we looked at the dynamics of the disease. How about making blood a window into health and disease? So uh, Gil Oman, who's here, uh, pioneered uh, this report on omics and how it had failed in the past, generally, to make successful diagnostic markers. This was published in 2012. And the reasons were twofold. One is everyone looked at blood uh, from normal and diseased, and you could see a lot of differences. 99% of the differences are noise. How do you separate noise from signal? Most people have no clue about how to do it. And, and basically, you can, I'll show you, use systems approaches to begin to do that. The other point was you had to look at individuals from multiple geographic populations so you could uh, cancel out the genetic diversity of the human populations. Doing things in one local population almost never led to really effective biomarkers. So <coughs> the other thing that's been revolutionary is with targeted mass spectrometry that has enormous sensitivity and the ability in an hour to analyze up to 150 or so proteins. This is the ideal technology for looking at diagnostic biomarkers. And at ISB, Robert Moritz, who pioneered together with Rudy Abersol the targeted mass spectrometry, also developed an atlas that had targeted assays for virtually all of the human proteins. So once you had your candidates, you could easily make uh, the assays you needed to detect those proteins in complex mixtures. So we used this with a company we started, Integrated Diagnostics, about six years ago to make blood a window into lung cancer so that you can distinguish benign nodules from neoplastic nodules in lung cancer. And of course, of course, the conundrum in lung cancer is you've got 3 million nodules a year. And what does the pulmonary oncologist do with these nodules? 600,000 of these come to various surgical procedures. More than half of them operate on benign nodules, unnecessary cost, unnecessary morbidity. So our objective was to create uh, a set a panel of proteins that could distinguish benign from neoplastic. So we used various systems approaches, and I'm not going to talk about them, to get about 400 candidates that supposedly were expressed in the blood. Half of them were reliably detected. And then we took the 190 candidates, and we used them to look at bloods from 
72 that had neoplastic and 72 that had benign lung nodules, and we scored the 190 with regard to their uh, ability to make those 144 calls. We found that there were 36 that were exceptionally successful. So what we next did was to create a panel of 10, well, a, a, a million panels of 10 randomly chosen from that pool of, of uh, 36. And then we uh, analyzed which proteins were most frequently in the panels that did the best, had the best record in making the correct 144 calls. And we found that uh, out of the 32, there were 13 proteins that were highly cooperative, seemed to be in most of the successful panels. And indeed, when we did a validation study, uh, initially we used four sites, and in the second one, we used a fifth site. Uh, we showed that, the, if anything, the proteins were even more effective in separating the benign and the neoplastic nodules and so forth. And of course, we went on to commercialize these things. And, and because uh, of the, the uh, uh, usual properties of this, so starting with 400, we got the panel of 13. They were able to call accurately more than 40% of the benign nodules, and it's now close to 60%, thus preventing a third of unnecessary surgeries. That saved the healthcare system $3.5 billion a year. And this is what sold the insurance companies to uh, accept this study, which has been uh, adopted pretty effectively. And of course, it lets the patient avoid uh, the unnecessary surgery. And of course, the really interesting question is, what do these proteins do? Because we went through this multiple filtering process. And the fact is, 12 out of 13 map into three major disease perturbed networks and uh, small cell lung cancer. So they give us the ability for early detection, as well as the ability for following progression of the disease and the response of the disease to therapy. I'll also say, because it's relevant to thinking about bipolar disease, that we used a similar approach. And now, actually, we have more than 50 soldiers from Afghanistan that came home normal, 50 that have extreme post-traumatic stress disorder, and we have a panel of proteins and of microRNAs that has about 95% sensitivity and specificity in distinguishing between the two. So this is the first neuropsychological disease that has ever been at a quantitative blood asset. And of course, that's what we want for bipolar and uh, other kinds of diseases. And I'll tell you, one of the things that makes this so powerful is we're using two independently derived <coughs> classes of biomarkers, namely proteins and microRNAs. And in this regard, this N counter, N string counter that I talked about earlier, which essentially is a single molecule assay detection instrument, has the ability at the same time to do SNPs, to do protein ELISA assays, to do microRNA assays and messenger RNA analyses all on the same uh, five uh, microliters of blood. So I think in the future, we may well be thinking about mixed biomarkers that give us uh, increased sensitivity and specificity. Now, in a collaboration with Jim Heath at Caltech, and Jim has done almost all the work on this, Jim or the company Indy Molecular, uh, to create peptide protein capture agents that are going to replace uh, antibodies. And the basic idea here is Jim constructed a library of 10 to the 7th circular 5-mer D-amino acid peptides. And he used the protein to select from that library low affinity monomer binders. And he showed with something called click chemistry that you could bind together two of those monomers in such a way that you created a dimer, or you could even create trimers or tetramers. With each mer addition, you got kind of an order 
increase in sensitivity and specificity. And a dimer of these circular peptides have affinities that's as good as most ordinary antibodies and so forth, uh, low nanomolar levels and so forth. What we've been able to demonstrate is in addition to being good diagnostic reagents, these are going to turn out to be fantastic therapeutic reagents. And for those of you who know anything about making uh, blockers of activity, RAS has been a very, very hard gene to target with therapeutics. And Jim did it beautifully in the very first example that he studied here. And we actually have some incredible studies going on with Merck on uh, immunotherapy and some of the key molecules there. So the features of this are these reagents are infinitely stable. You put them in an envelope and send them to Africa. They are sensitive. You can add MERS and get whatever affinity to very low picomolar sensitivity, if you wish. They are digital in the sense, once you know the two MERS plus the nature of the uh, click linking reagent, you can put that all in vitro with copper catalysis and synthesize the antibodies. So it means once you've figured out what it is, you've got it forever. You don't need an animal. Um, what Jim also figured out is he could use carefully selected peptides to focus the activity of these peptide protein capture agents. So it eliminated most of the cross reactivities that especially plague antibodies that are operating in the context of very complex mixtures like blood. And finally, we think we can scale this up to large scale. So we've demonstrated both in vitro and in vivo diagnosis and more recently therapeutic uh, reagents and so forth. As I said, I think it's going to replace monoclonal antibodies. And uh, the company is pushing this vision very hard at this point in time. Now, returning back again to the central theme of uh, systems medicine and P4 medicine, uh, over the last four or five years, there's been an enormously interesting convergence to, uh, I think, really define more precisely what P4 medicine is, namely predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And the first three Ps are pretty straightforward. The fourth P, participatory, for us means that the patient should be at the center of the decision-making process of their own health. And we'll show you how we think we can do that. So the convergence was systems biology or systems medicine. It was this digital revolution with Fitbits and other self-measurements. <coughs> it was big data and its analytics, and finally, it's social networks. And, and let me show you how P4 medicine really does differ strikingly from contemporary medicine. It's proactive rather than reactive. It's focused on individuals and not on populations. It's a major focus on wellness as well as disease, and not just on disease. Uh, it's all about generating these dense and dynamic personalized data clouds. And it is all about saying the classic way we do clinical trials, 30,000 patients, a drug or a placebo, extract the properties, is nonsense. And it's nonsense because each individual differs genetically and environmentally. And in averaging them, you enormously increase the noise and you decrease the signal. I'm not saying it'll never work, but I'm saying uh, there are much better ways to do it. And that is get 10,000 dense data clouds and then segregate them according to the unique properties of each individual with respect to traits you're interested in, response to a drug or failure response or what have you. And of course, the social networks are really all about communication, communicating <coughs> what the new medicine is to patients and frankly, hopefully to physicians too. Uh, letting the patients use crowdsourcing to be able to figure out how to optimize their own wellness. And then finally, I think patients are going to be real advocates for changing healthcare in a healthcare system that is intrinsically quite conservative and quite reluctant to change. So, P4 medicine is about two things it's about 
wellness quantified. It's about uh, uh, dealing with disease. And what is clear is 98% of society's resources today go into the disease end of the equation. And my prediction is <coughs> that this emerging scientific wellness is going to create a whole new thrust in healthcare, which will increasingly capture agents from the disease side of the uh, equation, such that I would argue in a 10 to 15 year period, scientific wellness will have a market cap that far exceeds that of the disease industry or the current uh, healthcare industry. And of course, wellness gives us two critically important things we don't get in any way from a study of disease. So the first is the ability to optimize human potential and capital by optimizing wellness. <coughs> and the second is the ability to follow wellness to disease transitions in very large populations and be able to look at the earliest transitions for all the major diseases and learn how we can convert those individuals back immediately to the health uh, trajectory. So just to stress how important wellness is, if you uh, extend current calculations on lifespan and so forth, you can make an argument 50% of the kids born in this calendar year will live to be 100. And I think the really key question is, what's the quality of their life in the last 30 or 35 years? And it isn't very good for an awful lot of people that live that long today. <coughs> so what we did, as I said earlier, in 2014, we persuaded 107 individuals to participate in a pilot project to generate these dense and dynamic data clouds. So we got whole genome sequences, then once every three months, we got blood and saliva and urine to ad identify and measure uh, clinical chemistry, 700 metabolites, and 400 proteins. Every three months, we got stool sample to do the gut microbiome. And then we continuously tracked uh, and self-monitored individuals with Fitbit and other kinds of measurements. And of course, this gave us these billions of data points uh, and uh, created this dense and dynamic individual data cloud. And of course, the idea there was if we could analyze it and compare it in an appropriate way with information from the literature, we could identify actionable possibilities for each individual that allowed them to optimize wellness and to minimize disease. And the really key thing we've learned is as we integrate together more types of data, there's an enormous expansion of actionable possibilities. So this will go on and on uh, for the indefinite future. And a really key part of the study is we use coaches to bring to each individual the actionable possibilities, <coughs> both explaining them and convincing them in the context of the individual's own health objectives that they should change their behavior and adapt these uh, possibilities. The coaches were essential in this study, and with them, we got a 70% compliance of actionable possibilities. And I would have guessed we'd be lucky if we got 5 or 10%. And that's probably more than most people get with telling people what to do. What we have here are an incredible number of NF1 experiments where we've manipulated all types of information. And you'll see that in just uh, a few moments. So Nathan Price, my colleague at ISB, has been my collaborator on these, uh, these analyses. And I like this analogy of, I think we've done for human biology and disease what the Hubble telescope did for the universe, namely, for the first time, enabled it to see correlations, information, and in a sense, the dark matter of the human universe. And so, I think have these studies allowed us to do really interesting kinds of uh, correlations. So how do we get rid of this thing? There we go. Uh, so 
Let me say what we did was display the individual data bits for each of the five major data types on a big circle, and this is only a small fraction of them. Then we use three different statistical methods for each data bit to ask, are there statistical correlations with any data bits in any of the other four data types? And we ended up with 35,000 really strong correlations. And I mean, this revealed new types of actionable possibilities. It revealed systems that were interlinked together. We had no idea were interrelated. And I'll, I'll show you one really interesting example. In the microbiome, there was a particular microbe that had a striking negative correlation with bile acid. And we were able to do text searching and show this microbe could destroy bile acid beautifully. And some of you may know there's a disease in the third trimester of pregnancy where the female hormones block the bile duct and bile spills into the blood. The women lose their appetite. They swell up. They respond to this very acidic environment. It's horribly uncomfortable. And the really interesting possibility is could you make uh, a probiotic that had this microorganism to give to these women to deal with that excess bile acid. So those are the kinds of uh, correlations that we could actually see. And we went on and did more text searching, and it's clear there's a gold mine of possibilities in these statistical correlations. And one can argue with 107 individuals, how good are the statistics? So we plan in the next 18 months to have 10,000 individuals, and we'll really be able to map this with some specificity. It turned out that we can actually map genetic uh, risk in, in our patients. And the first uh, hint we had of this is when we looked and were uh, struck with the fact 90 of 107 individuals were really low in vitamin D, and some had almost unmeasurable amounts of vitamin D. And in searching the literature, we'd found six variants and three genes that blocked vitamin D absorption, so keep that in mind. And the risks with low vitamin D are controversial, but unequivocally is certainly bone mineralization and some aspects of cardiovascular disease and so forth. But what was really interesting is, pardon? You know, I actually did add it. It's in a different slide I don't have here. Yes, I think that's true. Um, what we did was to bin the individuals according to whether they had four or five risk alleles, three or one or two. And what was really fascinating in the first tranche of clinical chemistries that we got, the disease risk correlated beautifully with the disease phenotype. That is, those with lots of alleles had low levels of vitamin D, and those with few had higher levels. And in fact, when we encouraged the individuals to take additional vitamin D, it more or less moved up still in parallel, correlating the genetic risk with, uh, with the disease phenotype, although we moved most people up into the more normal levels and everything. And of course, that gave us the idea that we could do exactly the same with genome-wide association study markers, GWAS markers. And you're all familiar with the fact these often include hundreds of thousands of individuals to, uh, for discovery and validation sets, and in this case, lipid levels were identified, uh, associated with 72 different loci. And of course, the striking thing about these loci is each of them has a very low effect on the phenotype, some positive and some negative, but with each uh, is associated a probability. So it meant that we could add these markers up for each individual and could, could determine, uh, at least for that individual, a relative genetic risk. And again, when we did that for the entire set of 107 individuals, we were able to bin those people into five categories from very low to very high, and to show beautifully that, again, the genetic risk correlated beautifully with the disease phenotype. The red here it has a sharp drown, uh, downfall, 
uh, at the highest level because those are the people taking statins. When they were removed, we got the, the green correlation that you see right there. And of course, what's really interesting about this is it gives us the way to stratify patients that we've never, ever had before. And a really important point is there are certain biomarkers that are associated with genetic risk for a disease that are not associated for the actual disease. Yet in studies, these two get conflated because you don't have the ability to separate risk from the actual disease. And this is really going to revolutionize our ability to get uh, biomarkers in the future. Showing you how the integration of different data types is, uh, lets us change how we would treat patients. I can give you an example here where we have high-risk individuals from a family uh, of 11 on the left-hand side and low-risk on the right-hand side. One is for HDL, the good lipid, and that's why the high-risk have low levels and the others for LDL, the bad lipid, and there the high risk has high levels. And what we can say is to a first approximation, again, there's a beautiful correlation between genetic risk and the disease phenotype here. And in fact, the exception are these two individuals that fall strikingly off the, 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 uh, the line. So in one case, the HDL level is very high. So this individual, was the most fit individual of the 107, a triathlete. He exercised four hours a day, was kind of a fanatic, and uh, look what he's done for himself. Uh, he's beaten his genetics easily. But the, the more interesting case is the other one, the individual that's way below his genetic potential. And the reason that's interesting is he's down where people with really high genetic risk fall and if you were a physician, it might be very easy to say we ought to treat all of these people in the same way. But I would argue, in fact, the person that is below his genetic risk should be managed initially with lifestyle changes, and the others may well uh, require um, uh, statins or so forth. What we're also able to do is move the risk from a relative thing from each individual into population studies because we have 2,000 uh, relatively normal genomes that we could assign these genetic risks to. And when we did that, we often got relatively bell-shaped curves onto which we could map the 107 individuals and see what their genetic risk was with respect to a population that more or less resembled uh, the population that they came from. And of course, if you think about um, uh, the GWAS diseases and so forth, there are close to 70 of them now. So we can calculate genetic risks for all of these. And I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's in just a second, but we could do exactly the same kind of thing with bi bipolar disease. So here are the relative risks for uh, Crohn's and obesity, late onset Alzheimer's, and psoriasis. And the late onset Alzheimer's really has this interesting biphasic uh, population. And it was interesting to see how the individuals with ApoE4 uh, alleles, both heterozygous and homozygous, mapped into this. And they mapped in uh, pretty well with the high risk levels. So what we're doing now is determining genetic risk from both uh, the ApoE4 alleles and the GWAS markers. We're mapping them onto the uh, 2,000 individuals to determine their risk compared to the normal population. Then what we're doing is creating a whole series of new assays that will allow us to more effectively look at very early transitions in the brain and the liver. We think the liver is an early organ, too, uh, to essentially identify the earliest stages of Alzheimer's. And we can think about blood diagnostics and therapeutics, but we're excited by the work Dale Bresident at, at UCLA has done on showing that if he can catch Alzheimer's at the earliest transitions, he has a 36-point regimen 
that can delay for five to 15 years the onset of the disease. And that's exactly what all of us would need if we were, in fact, in this high-risk group. And a, a final example of data of this type is the gut microbiome and its genetics. So here's a distribution of the ratios of uh, microbes present in the gut microbiomes of the 107 individuals. And it's more or less a continuous distribution. And the important thing is all of these people are more or less well. That isn't, some are a little less well than others, but they're all more or less well. So there aren't sharply defined subtypes, as a famous Nature paper said uh, some years ago. But even more interesting is when we build the 107 patients, uh, when we bend them with regard to their genetic propensity for Crohn's disease, and mapped on top of that the average gut microbiome for each set of individuals, we could show that there was one inflammatory microbe who, whose concentration increased perfectly in proportion to the increasing genetic risk. And what was interesting is in this set of 107 individuals, only one of them actually was diagnosed for Crohn's disease. So again, it means these markers are correlating with genetic propensity and not with Crohn's disease itself. And we're actually looking at our one Crohn's disease thing to begin identifying markers that he has that distinguish him from most of the rest of the high-risk kind of individuals. We've seen state transitions from less to greater wellness and the inverse from uh, wellness to disease and the inverse. And of course, we've seen beautiful examples of when people acted upon the actionable possibilities their chemistries changed exactly in accordance with what they expect. And that's enormously uh, positively reinforcing. The first clinical chemistry showed that 91% of the individuals were nutritionally deficient. 68% had uh, inflammatory uh, uh, scores that were high. Uh, and we had cardiovascular and, and diabetes risk scores. So we were able to deal with most of the nutrition with many of the inflammatory scores. We had 43 individuals that were pre-diabetic. We converted seven to completely normal levels, and almost all the rest moved significantly toward uh, a more normal level. We're doing out of one studies to find out why some pre-diabetics change very quickly and why others take much more effort and work to do it. Cardiovascular takes a lot longer time to change, although we've had uh, some good results in that. Genetic variance can determine what's the most effective diet for you. It can determine what's the most efficient exercise for you. And there are more than 300 SNPs that correlate with athletic injuries, many of which, if you know you have the variant, you can do things to avoid the injury. So. Uh, just to give you a story, we had one woman who was one of the most healthy, again, uh, a marathon runner who had chronically been overweight about 15 pounds her entire life. And we told her, one, you have to stop eating simple carbohydrates, and two, your most efficient exercise is power, not aerobic. And she lost 10 pounds for the first time in her life in a period of about four months. So, these things uh, really can change people's, uh, people's lives in that regard. Wellness to uh, disease to wellness transition. We had a number of individuals that had very, very high iron levels. And one of the most interesting was an individual that had acquired about a year ago increasing chronic arthritis, had uh, concierge physicians, East Coast and West Coast, that uh, had tried to diagnose him. And then we did the genetic analysis, and he was homozygous for hemochromatosis. And of course, we sent that information to his physician, and with a couple of uh, simple blood unit bleeds, that brought him down to normal, and in a six-month period, his arthritis had reversed. So that's the kind of thing that uh, one can uh, begin to think about doing. 
So we've got these marvelous statistical correlations that are going to open up a lot of new avenues. We have beautiful ability to bin individuals with regard to genetic risk. And in five out of five cases where we've looked at it, those correlate with uh, disease phenotypes. And we've actually looked at a number of individuals that have gone from less to greater wellness in the inverse. And from those, we've begun to get metrics that fall mostly in the metabolomic and the protein class that we think are going to be the beginning of a panel of biomarkers that will let us assess wellness. And we think we can assess both physiologic and psychologic wellness. The pioneer insights, uh, a number of them said this was a transformational experience. And I would say a lot of these were my friends, and about half of them were skeptical of the study and whether it would ever do anything. Everybody got their mind changed in that regard. The second thing that was really interesting is how many people felt liberated by the fact that with information, they could really control their own decisions in making health and so forth. And they realized that you know genetics don't control your destiny. They control your potential. And you can eliminate many genetic limitations with proper lifestyle changes and so forth. Every one of the 107 had multiple actionable possibilities. There was an enormous spectrum in the number they had. And everyone ended up uh, improving in wellness by objective measures uh, by a number of different criteria. I pointed out that because of coaches, 70% of the actionable possibilities were acted upon. And almost all the pioneers wanted to continue, continue into the next longitudinal study. And that phase was creating a company about two and a half months ago that is oriented toward wellness science and consumers. And with it, we hope to generate 10,000 dense and dynamic individual data clouds in the next 18 months. And in fact, we went to the company because we saw this as the quickest way uh, to generate uh, this type of company. We obviously hope this is going to be a major company in this wellness sector that I uh, had talked about. The second thing we're doing is continuing in an academic vein, looking both at these dense, dynamic data clouds of individuals, one, to optimize wellness in new and different ways, and two, to deal with disease in interesting ways. And I'll say at the very end, give you some examples of how we're going to do that. So I think this project has generated a vast array of actionable possibilities. It's used those to optimize wellness and avoid or reduce disease. We have the beginning of multi-parameter metrics for wellness. We're beginning to look at the early disease transitions and beginning to understand mechanisms in at least uh, one different disease. We're driving the improvement of old assays and creating new assays, uh, mostly around the microfluidics format, that will allow us to drive down the cost through digitalization of medicine. The assays are the most expensive part of this uh, study. And I think in a 10-year period, we'll see that the assays will be 5 to 10% uh, or less of what they are today. We have a database of wellness and disease transitions that's going to be uh, catalyze innovation, I think, in this new wellness industry in very interesting ways. And this brings all the essence of P4 medicine to healthcare, uh, improving quality, decreasing cost, and, and, uh, and promoting innovation. There are lots of reasons why I think the costs are going to go down. But rather than argue with insurance companies now, we'll wait till we have 10,000 dense dynamic data clouds. Then I think I can get a lot of economic metrics that are uh, good, valid proof of principle. But you know, digitization of medicine, systems approaches, and the wellness project all lead to improving health care and decreasing the cost of medicine. So I think P4 medicine is going to play a major role in health care in the future. I think health is really all about assessing both our genetics and our environment. 
And these dense and dynamic data clouds are absolutely an ideal way of doing that. Wellness is going to let us optimize human potential or capital, but it's also going to give us all of the common wellness to disease transitions to begin early conversion back to wellness. These data clouds are going to absolutely transform how pharma, uh, biotech, uh, nutrition companies, diagnostic companies practice their art in the future. Of course, it's going to be a major role to convince them of that. But I think we're going to have some very, very compelling arguments. And of course, what's exciting with the new industry we're creating, I think we're going to be able to drive the cost down to where we can begin to go and bring these things in time to the poor as well as to the rich, leading to a democratization of health care that would really have been inconceivable to think about even uh, four or five years ago. And of course, the, the, the last point that I would make is I think this is really going to let us approach two problems of old age. One is how can we optimize our potential in our waning years? And the second is how do we avoid the enormous penalty of dying over three or four years and spending more than half your health care dollars all at once? So keep in mind two things. One, Eric Topol at Scripps has studied a thousand individuals that are 90 years or older, never been to a hospital, never been to a doctor, never taken a drug, incredibly healthy. And so he calls them the welderly. So we're going to aspire to make people who uh, do scientific wellness the welderly. We'll talk about that in a minute. The second observation we made in the context of studying 18 individuals that were 115 or older to see whether we could identify genes that were enriched for longevity. And we couldn't because the power wasn't great enough. But what I did discover is if you get to be 100, almost always you die really rapidly of a complete systems failure. So I think the essence of what we want to do with scientific wellness is we want to have you make it a lifelong journey where you act upon all the newly emerging actionable possibilities so we will make you operationally the welderly. So you can go well into your 90s, functional and effective. And of course, if we get you to 100, then you're on your own to deal with the system <laughs> scratch. So anyway, let me just give a couple of examples for bipolar disease in the last slide. We can stratify patients in so many new and powerful ways. Stratification is really the key to solving complex diseases. So there are many ways we could go about doing that together. We can bring wellness to those that are at risk for bipolar disease, family members, those that have genetic predispositions, and follow wellness to disease transitions and warn you at the very earliest stage and maybe come to understand what some of those earliest transitions are. And we can even follow those with bipolar disease, not only to see how they respond to therapy, but to follow their changes over time and bring warning signs to physicians as to how to optimize their wellness and so forth. And I think we can make these same kinds of applications to uh, other neuropsychiatric diseases and certainly other diseases as well. But the point I'd leave you with is I think this uh, dense, dynamic, longitudinal approach to looking at patients will allow us to do the stratifications that are going to lead to enormous breakthroughs in complex diseases. And it would be fun to do it with you in bipolar disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. I told you we would be in for a, uh, for a major treat. And so uh, I see we have the photographer here. And I just want to call upon uh, Wally to, uh, just to come up. We're going to present Lee with the, uh, with the gift. And we'll get one last uh, shot uh, here. And then we want to open it up uh, for, uh, for questions. So I okay. uh, just have Wally with the, the, this. And so uh, with Lee okay. here. And thank you. Thank you very much. OK. So for those of you that are wondering what we're doing, uh, we made some uh, ties 
this past spring of stem cells uh, that were from uh, Dr. O'Shea's lab, and um, uh, and we have a limited made a limited edition of them and uh, uh, gifting them out uh, to uh, people, special people such as uh, as uh, Lee here. Uh, so I want to open it up for questions, uh, questions for Dr. Hood and, or questions for myself, Lily Gloria, and others. So there's two people that have the microphones in hand. There. So just raise your hand and uh, a microphone will appear in it faster than you can imagine. Uh, hi, very nice talk, Lee. The, um, so you mentioned briefly that uh, a lot of what you're seeing is coming out of the genomic data rather than the exome data, and yet there's a large, a large number of studies going on in the U.S. which are basically capturing large sets of exomes and diseases. So. Um, First of all, now what you're getting more of this sort of uh, really a picture of how personalized genomics would work. How, what percentage do you think is actually coming outside of the exome, and do you think we're just going to end up having to repeat each of these 10,000 or 20,000 exome studies that are ongoing in Alzheimer's and epilepsy and a wide variety of diseases? Yeah. Well, I think the monoclonal genomic diseases probably are mostly exome. Okay. So what I'm talking about here is are the complex genetic diseases. And, and my guess is many of the complex genetic diseases are going to be control and regulation. They aren't going to be uh, exonic in nature. But look, this is similar studies haven't been done on other uh, complex diseases. So it's, you have to be careful about making statements. But you know, it's really quite striking where we looked at uh, 41 families where we looked at um, 3,000 sporadics, we got uh, a large set of these variants. And when you look at them, as a whole, 90% of them or so are clearly outside coding regions and everything. So that is, that is pretty striking. But it isn't to say that you won't have major uh, modifications in coding regions that could contribute to these diseases as well. We, we, did have, we did have several coding variants which had major changes, so it wasn't surprising that it, it led to a disease. It's just that I think almost everybody that's doing exon sequencing today will absolutely do it all over again. So you better save your DNA sample. And, and you'll do it when it's cheap and inexpensive and easy to do. But don't let go of the DNA samples because there's infinitely more information in the whole genome, clearly, than just exons. There's a microphone there. Oh, yeah. If the average person off the street um, wanted to go to their physician and have this sort of genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, sequencing and analysis that you did for each of these people in the 100-person wellness project. I'm wondering, would that be possible today, and how much would it cost, um, roughly? You, you know, I think it wouldn't be possible because most physicians wouldn't have the faintest idea what any of that information meant. And I think it would really be expensive because we got great deals with vendors because we were doing large numbers, and we could send samples in all at once, and if you did them, independently, I, I think. It, but if you're independently wealthy, you certainly uh, could try and do that. You'd have to find someone to do the analysis for you. And again, I think there aren't very many groups that can do that very effectively. So I think it'd be hard. So what you should do is move to Seattle, and you can, you can <laughs> join Aravale, and we'll do scientific wellness with you. Uh, you. We could. And we're thinking about actually setting it up so academic centers could become essentially vendors for doing this if there were enough people interested. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually fascinated by your switch from precision medicine to precision wellness in a way. And I mean, on a very small scale, I'm kind of, you know, we, I, I got 23andMe data from me and a whole bunch of people in the family, and I'm now the person trying to figure out what it is. What do you think will be the future, to pick up on the previous question, 
Do you really think that in the future this kind of analysis will be in the hand of some of physicians? Will physicians be able to handle this, or is this more something where we need to educate the general public and the general public will be educated? Or will it be possible to get the information, as you were saying, it will democratize things, which means you may be able to give the information down to the level of the poor. Because currently, what I can do with 23andMe data, and for a few people I know, is actually the opposite. Because of the FDA block on getting any of the data out to anyone, it's actually not possible to get anything out for $99. So it's actually anti-democratic. So yeah. I wonder what your uh, position and your feeling about uh, sure. this whole situation is. So what I would say is the, for the physicians of the 107 we did, I would say a third of them embraced this project and were really excited, wanted to find out about it. A third were utterly indifferent, and a third were absolutely hostile and negative and threatened their patients they shouldn't do this. And five patients left those physicians, just to put it in perspective, because they decided that's not what they wanted. My feeling is a physician will never have the time to do this kind of thing. And so it will be done, uh, it will be done in, in a automated venture that's set up specially to do it. It could be a company like Aerofail, or we can set it up in clinical centers to do it, then you have most of the wherewithal to be able to do a lot of those kind of things easily. So it could be done a lot of different ways. We're, we're talking with a major healthcare provider uh, in uh, the state of Washington to become, to bring this to them so we can really bring it, not only in the context of bringing wellness to the patients, but in the context of studying disease in an incredibly powerful new way. And they're really very excited about it. So I think centers that embrace this could really set up the means for doing this kind of thing. What I've always argued is if you really wanted to transform medical education, what I would recommend you do is take your first year of medical students, put them through this program, have them analyze their own data, have them come to understand what systems medicine and P4 medicine are about, and we're just finishing up a book on systems medicine and P4 medicine, that would be a great introduction. But I do it the second year, and I adjust those courses to more sophisticated approaches to physiology and pathology, and then the same for the clinical years. I think you could follow a couple of classes through, and you could transform medic medical education. And I think the enormous barrier to doing that are the teachers. I don't know that the teachers would want to change the lectures they've given for the last 10 years. So, uh, but anyway. In many ways, Margaret, are you advocating for a kind of a genetic dual lump uh, sort of a thing that, or someone, I mean, to have people that would be versed, you know, in the... Uh, in, in advocating anything. I'm, I wanted to hear Dr. Hood's opinion, but I, 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 I do not, I agree with you that most physicians cannot handle yeah, this information, yeah. and currently uh, the hands were tied so that people can handle it themselves through some kind of algorithm. Right now, there is no easy way for, for a physician to get the overall, for a patient or any subject, to get some kind of uh, interpretation of the data. So right now, people are trying it on their own in various ways. And if you're a very good bioinformatician, you can get a lot of data out. And if you're not, you I'll tell you, if you're a very good bioinformatician, I think most of them couldn't get very much out. This really requires a lot of things they don't ordinarily do. But that, but those are all teachable, and those kind of things. Thank you very much for all of this information. It's very enlightening. I'm a member of the community. I'm not in the scientific world. How can this information be brought to a type of verbiage that the general population in this country and around the world can start to talk about this now 
do you have any connections with writers, perhaps, that um, could bring this information right away to the public? Because I think that's where it could start with um, encouraging the consumer, the public, the patient, to develop a desire for this information. And I know that part of your model was to use the social networking. But beyond that, I mean, some, some book that would uh, right, right. You go through the talk circuits, you know, right. that sort of thing. Thank you. So I agree with you completely. And I think that is really an important area. And you know, what's unfortunate is the few of us who are really deeply engaged in this thing are so busy doing the science, we don't have time to write books on the side. But I think good articles that got out into uh, national magazines would be a good idea. And we are beginning to explore that possibility. And, and you know, we're thinking about how to use social media to, uh, for example, I wrote an annual letter for the Institute of Systems Biology this year, which was, you know, my synopsis of where I think the future of healthcare is going. And it talked about all of these things in very general terms. So it would really be great to have a way to get that out to a broader kind of general audience. And there's not any very simple way to do that right now. So, so I agree with you completely, and we are thinking about that. If we merge with this um, uh, health provider, they have an incredible educational facility for physicians. And I can really see taking on some major physician education programs. It would be very exciting. And then, look, you'd, you'd filter and get the ones that were more interested initially and so forth. So, um, but I think reaching out to the public is really key, too. I agree. Well, yes? Wouldn't that be possible through the organizations that chronic illnesses have? like NAMI and the DBSA and the Asthma Society and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. They all have major associations with very interested family members right, right. who would be perhaps active in uh, following yeah. it and contributing to it. Sure. The, the challenge is getting to the right people and convincing them. And that really takes a long time. And again, I just... Um, I don't have the time to spend um, uh, pursuing and courting and convincing these kind of people. If there, were, if there were some general overarching council, that would be terrific. But if you take the organizations on one at a time, and I've, I've been to a couple of them, and they have people that are every bit as conservative as the healthcare system has. So it's not trivial. So. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and uh, I really appreciate your talk about this uh, great application of the big data science. Uh, so one of the concerns I have about this research is, uh, so for patients, they now they have to generate a lot of data and you know share this data with a lot of people. And uh, uh, I believe the uh, privacy and uh, the data security can be a uh, great problem for uh, you know all the participants to deal with and. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, the sure. situation? Sure. I mean, look, security was a big issue that we dealt with early on. So number one, the, at the very first, the patient is separated from their data. They're, it's de-anonymized so that anything any of the investigators look at is, is totally de-anonymized. And number two, we've spent an enormous amount of time both building a database that we think is fantastically secure and hiring re really good people to break in, try and break into it and see what you can do. And we're, we're quite confident. I mean, look, a Russian hacker maybe could. Uh, but ordinary people will never, ever be able to get into this database. And, and separating people from their data at the very beginning really uh, has uh, a big insurance in that. And the people code is in an incredibly secure place that we, uh, we don't talk about. So I'll tell you, I think you know, the security issues, the ethical issues, uh, et cetera, I think the big issue that we still haven't solved 
is discrimination. And I really do worry about that because Gina and Obamacare both deal with uh, uh, health insurance, but they don't deal with life insurance. They don't deal with long-term disability. And I think you have to have all of these things covered. So, and with the kind of education we've done, our experience was 98% of the 107 pioneers agreed to have their data after the anonymization used, and almost the same percentage in the first 400 we've brought into the company have agreed to do that, where we've explained the security and all of these kind of things. So I think people feel fairly comfortable, but they, they but we can't answer the question about discrimination. I mean, can your insurance company make you give up your genome by saying, have you ever had your genetic variants tested for Alzheimer's or uh, breast cancer or any of these kind of things? I think that's still an issue. And uh, I think we have to get busy and tidy up that last level of discrimination and get it closed. Thank you very much. Uh, John? Uh, to finish the question, can they make you turn it in or can they basically drop you if you don't? You know, and that's, yeah, that's absolutely. Cool I, one, I wanted to thank you. You're forcing us to think. Two, in response to the questions that came back there, there is this cynical perspective that many of us have heard so often about culture eats strategy for lunch. I mean, it, uh, our cultures are pretty entrenched. And I think even getting organizations like NAMI and DBSA and others you were on this committee of 12, and six of the people, sophisticated, educated, um, invested in wanting to do things better for the future, didn't want to follow the course that we're now following. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're facing. So I just wanted to grab the mic to say, like breast cancer, when it kind of came from being an orphan disease into the framework of we need to be studying this, and that came because women collectively just said, you can't leave us behind anymore. I think the voices are all back here. And you need to go home. <laughs> and uh, you need to vote. You need to convey your viewpoints. You need to write op-ed pieces. And uh, eventually, we're watching this tipping point. It's going to cross over on this viewpoint, too. And then we'll figure out how to do it safely, how to do it scientifically, and how to do it economically, because this is our future. And right. thank you so much. Right. Well, you know, actually, in response to your question, one thing we could do is create a website for uh, <clears throat> consumers, for unsophisticated people that has a lot of literature where you can go and read it and decide what you think. So that would be something we could think about and then <laughs> yeah, I you know, I'm not, and I have to say, I stay off those things because I am really busy. And I think the signal to noise in most of those social media things is absolutely terrible. Yeah, but, but I mean, and maybe Facebook is really a terrific way to go, even against my resistance. Uh, I can hire a little fairy that can actually... Okay, we're going to stick with the microphone. So Barbara has a microphone, and then the uh, gentleman. So yeah. first, Barbara. Dr. Hood, uh, I have a, a question about the... You talked about the transition. Where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm here. okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. You talked about the transition, identifying the transition from wellness to disease, mm -hmm. and that if you can do that at the very early stage, that you can reverse uh, the disease. Is it, in the future, do you see that uh, applying to all diseases across I the do. board? I do. I see. We can do that for diabetes now. We, if we follow it carefully, you can, you can identify a pre-diabetic state very early, and we know exactly what you need to do to reverse it. We want to do that for all diseases. And that's a big job, and I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying we know how to do the reversals, but we, I think we do know how to get the diagnostics that will warn us that there's something here we have to watch for. So. Thank you, everyone. Uh, time for one final question. 
Yeah, I just, um, I'm not in marketing or public relations, but it seems to me there's a universal that everybody wants a better world for their own child. And if we were really to switch the focus from ourselves and the elderly to a better world for my child, my child ought to have one of these passports at birth. I, I agree with that totally. In fact, the argument we give to our clients about making their data available is exactly that. The argument is your data will change medicine and improve health care for your kids and your grandkids. And that's a winner every single time, absolutely. So with that, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hood for coming and uh, presenting. It's a very inspirational and just a phenomenal talk. I thank you so much.